All right, well, I think we'll get started now. We've got people in Ustream tonight. We've got people in Illuminate tonight. And one of the reasons I'm doing this is to show uh, that we can do this in multiple places, and there is a bit of a difference in how we do these things. Um, some people are actually uh, able to do both at the same time, which is kind of neat. So we have sort of the front row in Illuminate, and we have the back channel, uh, although there would be some back channel also in Illuminate. Back channel in a free service called Ustream. So for those of you not familiar uh, with Ustream, it's a free service that allows you to stream uh, video from webcams, um, from regular video cameras, or from even the screen as we're doing tonight. Um, so it's actually kind of a neat piece. So uh, I noticed that some people are saying the audio is better in Illuminate, like Amy. Uh, welcome, Amy. Um, we have Stephen Downs tonight. Uh, you actually have a Wikipedia page, and it's really nice. I think you're the first person in the course that has their own Wikipedia page. Um, Stephen Downs, right from the page, designer and commentator in the fields of online learning and new media, and he's uh, one of the great Canadians in this field, certainly uh, in the field of learning in general, not just online learning. Um, and uh, if you haven't caught him before, on OL Daily, you should really check it out. Kyle has put out the link there, and also on the blog half an hour. Um, but he's a, a continual source of news and inspiration and some great ideas for uh, people within the field and within learning in general, and we're very lucky to have him here tonight. So uh, without anything more, I think I'll just welcome you, uh, Stephen, and we're going to talk about the future of learning tonight. So this is very exciting for all of us. So go right ahead. And thanks. And the format is ask questions when necessary. Um, and of course, there'll be discussion in both Ustream and Illuminate. So thanks again, Stephen. Uh, let's continue. Well, uh, hi, Alec, and thank you. And it's a pleasure to be here joining you in this course. And it's a pleasure to meet so many people, both in Illuminate and in Ustream. Uh, just on that Wikipedia page, uh, it was uh, not only is there a page, it was a candidate for quick deletion and then a candidate for deletion, and it actually survived the Wikipedia review. So it might be there to last for a little while. It's kind of a neat thing to watch. Um, particularly after I've said harsh things about the Wikipedia people who go around deleting pages, but that's a separate issue. For those of you who are signed on, um, I'm uh, on both the Illuminate, and that's of course where you're hearing my primary audio. I've also got the Ustream window open, so if you're chatting in the uh, Ustream, I can uh, see you chatting in the Ustream. It's really hard to talk and to read back channels at the same time. I've learned that from harsh, harsh experience. And with two separate back channels, one on each side of my computer, uh, each side of my computer screen, it's going to be almost impossible. So um, I'm going to count on Alec and anybody else to jump in and interrupt. Uh, I know that. Uh, You've set it up, Alex, so that you can jump in even when I'm talking. You don't need to wait for me to stop. Uh, we'll get a bit of a more background sound when you do that, but that will at least stop me. And uh, we can take any questions or comments. I don't mind if you have questions or comments as we go along. Uh, you know, that breaks up the, the monotony of my voice. Um, if my sound sounds a little off, it's because I'm using the built-in microphone in my MacBook here. Uh, the uh, microphone jack is toasted. There's a long and sad story behind that. And also, I'm struggling with more than a bit of a cold. So even if you were standing right next to me, my voice would be a bit muffled. Here's, uh, oh yeah, and you can use the hands up feature as well. Uh, and I might notice that. Uh, <laughs> sorry. What I want to talk about today is, uh, as the title slide suggests, future learning. I actually gave a version of this presentation just a few hours ago um, to uh, to William Drake's uh, Learn Online course. And uh, I, I've given it once or twice before. And it's a fairly far ahead look at where learning is going in the long term. And I want to set a bit of context to that. 
Uh, Ten years ago, I wrote a paper called The Future of Online Learning. And I wrote that paper because I was developing online courses and developing a learning management system uh, at a Cinnabon Community College. And I was spending a lot of time doing this. And they said, well, we'd be very supportive, but if, we, if only we knew what you were doing. And so I went on two weeks vacation. I spent my vacation writing this paper, The Future of Online Learning. And it projected a whole bunch of trends with respect to online learning. It projected things like learning management systems, which were you know just a green in programmers' ideas at the time. It projected learning objects or usable learning resources and online courses and all of that sort of stuff. The stuff that I've been talking about over the last few years. Last year, I revisited that paper. Uh, so I wrote uh, something called The Future of Online Learning 10 Years On, and I posted it uh, on my web blog. And many of the predictions that I made in 2008 held up very well through those 10 years and through my reinvestigation. And so where I sit now is not just with a snapshot trying to predict where things are happening, but now I'm actually sitting on, uh, sitting on some trend lines, at least you know, trend line from the perspective of personal perception, from the perspective of me looking at the internet and seeing what I see. Uh, and I'll be very frank about this. These are not, you know, I haven't gone out and done, uh, you know, detailed surveys of people's attitudes. I haven't gone out and counted this or that or the other thing. These are general impressions. They are fallible. Of course, they are fallible. But they are, are nonetheless, I think, well grounded, well grounded with experience, well grounded with what numbers are out there. You know, there's 150 million Facebook pages, that tells me something. Uh, you know, 10 billion web pages on Google, that tells me something. Uh, you know, 60 million uh, content creators, that tells me something. 15 million Creative Commons Google images, that tells me, or Creative Commons Flickr images. Yeah, you know, so there are numbers. Uh, I just haven't organized them systematically, and I don't want to organize them systematically because what I'm after here is general patterns, general shapes, general trends, general directions. Now, you guys are all in different circumstances, in different places. Technology is impacting you in different ways. For many of you, and I used to live in the north, I used to live in northern Alberta, in the north country, peace country. Uh, and uh, you know, I know that technology is unevenly distributed, um, and so you can't necessarily count on this or that technology being available in your community. And I don't want you to take the perspective of uh, this is not really going to apply to me at all. Uh, rather, the way I want you to take this particular, uh, this particular. Not only have I been to Meadow Lake, I've actually stayed overnight there in the hotel and drank in the pub in the hotel. So, and had very long and important conversations in Meadow Lake. Never mind. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, long conversations. Um, but the way I want you to think about this is, I'm talking about various trends. And you should take those trends and match them against the technological environment, the software environment, the learning environment where you are, and use these trends as a way of assessing whatever happens to be current in your community now. Because to, to simplify this, um, a particular piece of technology, T, either will support one of these trends or won't support one of these trends, say. If it supports one of these trends, then it's probably something that you want to spend some time on. It's probably something that you want to promote. It's probably something you might want to invest resources in. Contrary, or by contrast, if it does not support one of these trends, then you probably don't want to spend a whole lot of time on it. It might be something faddish. It might be something that you know was a good idea once, but now is, has sort of fallen by the wayside. Whatever. So the idea here is use, insofar as you think appropriate, use these projections as a benchmark 
against which to assess technological developments and, and pedagogical developments in your own community. And I'll ask if that sounds okay, and you can just type into the chat window if that sounds okay or if that sounds like a reasonable thing to say. And while you're doing that, I'll move to the uh, I'll move to the uh, next slide. So there's going to be a couple of second delay while you type your comments into the chat window, assuming that you do. I hope someone does. I haven't seen any yet. Uh, okay, we're seeing very clear in, in Jaybird main saying K. Uh, in Amy Bowen saying explain, and I'm not sure if she's responding to me or Alec. Okay, well, I'm just going to launch into this. Okay, Amy. Uh, First of all, what I want to do is I want to explore this topic in three major parts. First of all, I want to talk a bit about what we want to do, what learning will look like, what we want to think of learning as. Secondly, I want to talk about who we are and what we're trying to do, what, what the new skills will be, what, what the new uh, processes will be. And then finally, I want to look briefly at what the technologies are that will enable that. So to begin with, I do want to spend some time looking at what we're up to because in, the, in all these discussions of learning, it's so common for us to think about what's going to happen in the future as being the same sort of thing as what will happen in the past. We think that learning in the future will consist of classes, it will consist of courses, it will consist of schools, it will consist of teachers, uh, it will consist of steps and baby steps and all of that. Um, and I want to offer you, at this point, a different picture of learning. And just to put this, because somebody asked, well, how do we con convince the parents? This isn't a matter of convincing people that this is the way to go or anything like that. Rather, this is a case of one model of learning gradually overtaking and replacing the other almost from external or from outside the system rather than as a change we've made to the system. Okay, let me talk about what I mean by that. First of all, I want you to think of learning as ambient. Uh, the, the picture I'm presenting here is learning that is available whenever, wherever we want to learn about something. Now, these birds are kind of hard to see these birds on this screen, but these birds were sitting on the roof across, on a house across the street from me. I took this picture of them, and I wonder what kind of birds they are, because Obviously, they're not crows, because crows are big and black and loud, and these weren't. As it turns out, they're cedar waxwings. And the way I found out that they're cedar waxwings was by going online and looking for birds, and looking for birds of this particular type. And the last thing here is that I was able to learn about these birds that were across the street from me. Yeah, they, they look similar to gray jays, but you can look at the little yellow on the tail. Uh, I was able to learn about these birds just by looking them up when and where I needed to know about these birds. I didn't take a course about these birds. Uh, I didn't take a program about these birds or anything like that. Recognizing these birds was in no way part of my education. It's just learning that was available to me when I needed it. Uh, as uh, Mrs. Dirk said, on-demand learning. Okay, how does that unfold? Well, I have a story that I've told many times. I love this story, and I'm really waiting for one of these. And it's the story of the intelligent fishing rod. And the intelligent fishing rod story goes like this. You're standing by the lake. It looks a lot like this lake that you see in front of you. You've got your brand new fishing rod, and you want to go fishing, and you go fishing, and you put your lure on your line, and you cast your line into the water, and whirr, your line goes up and pop, your lure drops into the water, and then your fishing rod remarks to you, you've never fished before, have you? And you look around because you don't expect the fishing rod to speak to you, but you realize your fishing rod is speaking to you, and your fishing rod then offers to teach you how to fish. So you, you roll in your finger your line, and you try casting again, and your fishing rod talks to your blackberry, and your blackberry speaks to you and explains with pictures how you should be casting. You try casting, and the fishing rod, which has a little gyroscope 
two sensors inside, noticing that your performance has improved, and it says very good, your performance has improved, and, and by and by, you interact with your fishing rod, and you learn how to fish. And the idea here is that what's happening, it's not simply that you are learning from your fishing rod, although that's pretty amazing, but more importantly, you are learning about a thing in the process of doing the thing. Rather than simply being told how to fish, rather than being shown how to fish, you are learning how to fish in the act of fishing. And the rods will be made extra strong so that they don't break when you drop them. I'm not the first person to think of this. Bruce Sterling, a science fiction author, wrote a, a book called Distraction. And uh, one of the things that happens in this, book's, in, in this book is that a group of people who are working down East Texas, Louisiana area, they need to build a hotel. So they order a hotel kit. And the hotel kit arrives. And the first brick of the hotel says, start with me. And then each piece of the hotel instructs the crew how to build the hotel step by step by step. They don't even need to learn how to build the hotel. All they need to do is to learn how to get the information from the hotel explaining how to build the hotel. The idea here is that the instructions, the learning that is required comes with the resources or the objects that, that uh, we acquire. And you might think that that's you know, kind of out there. But if you think about it, that's the way video games already work. When uh, a person gets a new uh, computer game, they load the computer game onto the, uh, onto the computer, and then they don't sit down and then read the instruction manual. Nobody does that. Except, you know, newly, well, nobody does that. They start the game and they start playing. And they learn how to play the game as they play the game. The doing and the learning become one and the same thing. And there isn't actually learning. You don't go out and then you don't go out and learn some stuff and then do it. The two things are combined. All of this sits in the framework of what might be called a network that knows. Think about the fishing rod again. How does the fishing rod know how to teach you how to fish? Well, I'll tell you right off the bat, the fishing rod isn't that smart. What the fishing rod has to do is it has to connect to other resources that are out there on what we now call the internet about how to fish. And it will need to connect to the right sort of resource for the person who is holding the fishing rod right now. Now, there are different ways of going about how to set that up. But the idea here, because we're still in the what part of the, of the equation, the idea here is that the configuration of the network itself will inform the fishing rod of exactly what the best resource is the best mechanism is to offer lessons on how to fish for this person sitting right here right now. The idea is if you structure a network of resources and people and services and sensors and the rest, that this self-organizing network can manage to instantiate the process of learning and doing all at the same time. There's a, an intense discussion of fishing taking place in the Illuminate discussion list. Not much happening over in the uh, Ustream discussion list. I think everybody's abandoned Ustream for the Illuminate. Uh, it's, it's interesting to see this uh, going way off topic, but that's OK. How does this network work? This network works by one very simple and basic principle, and that's the principle of people who share. The whole idea here is that the network is populated with learning materials that are produced as a consequence of people sharing online, people sharing their knowledge online, people sharing their experiences online, people sharing their successful casts online. A person casts 
and their cast goes beautifully. Their fishing rod worked perfectly for them. They record that cast. That becomes an instance of a successful cast. That successful cast becomes the paradigm knowledge that later shows up in the lesson that the person was taking from some other fishing rod somewhere down the line. Uh, MIT may have called this intellectual philanthropy, but it's not philanthropy. I, 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 you know, I mean, people, it's like the OECD report on open educational resources. It was titled Giving Knowledge for Free. This isn't charity. This isn't giving. This is sharing. It's a, that's a very different thing. Sharing and giving are two different things. Sharing is to participate in a community in some way. Giving is to put yourself above that community and then donate down to it. Do you see the difference? I don't want to get bogged, in, bogged down on this, but, uh, but there, there really is a big difference between philanthropy and being a member of a community. Okay. So that's the object. And again, this is probably not going to appear in your local school anytime soon, right? But this is what is developing out there in the background. This is the, the learning environment that is growing very slowly outside of our institutions. And there are all kinds of signs, all kinds of ways we can see that this environment is growing. And gradually, bit by bit, this this environment that's growing outside the schools is reaching into the schools. So, who is doing what? What are the things? What are the skills? What, are, what is the learning that is taking place in this sort of environment? Because I gave the example of the, the fishing rod that teaches you how to fish. And so our, our first reaction is to say, OK, well, the learning that is taking place is how to fish, right? But no, that's because most people don't need to learn how to fish. And right? only people with fishing rods that are near water need to learn how to fish. The learning that's taking place is different than that. I want to linger on that for just a few moments. Basically, what is, again, gradually happening, happening outside the educational system is that the system of the three R's, which are you know, content-based, object-based kinds of learning, is being replaced by what might be called the three L's, language, logic, and learning. And each of these can be represented, or, or needs to be represented, needs to be described so that it's understood clearly. So let me begin with language. Now, language, of course, is uh, something that we're all familiar with in a certain sense, but we're all familiar with a, a very particular type of language, and that is language that is composed of words, language that is composed of sentences, language that is, in other words, sentential, propositional, language that is composed, in other words, of signs that signify objects and signify relations in the world. What is happening is that language is beginning to change. Language is beginning to evolve. That doesn't mean that the text-based language disappears, but rather the text-based language is merging with multimedia, video, audio, graphical, animated, all kinds of native, different kinds of digital objects. The paradigm case of this is the LOLCAT, L-O-L-C-A-T. If you don't know what they are, look them up on Google after the class. Lowell cats are popularly considered to be a screen. Most people just love them. What a lowell cat is, is a picture of a cat, usually a funny cat, and some text, usually some very badly written text. And the idea is that the image and the text create a screamingly funny image. But what's significant about a lowell cat is two things. First of all, the text and the image combine to form a single object. This single object, meanwhile, is funny, but it's funny in a very specific context. The object acquires meaning not from the image, not from the text, but from its placement in a particular context. The law cat, in a given context, in a given universe of discourse, is used as a word in the vocabulary. 
A wall cat is like one guy nudging another guy with the elbow. You get that? You get that? Or, you know, it's like, you know, a one liner that Groucho Marx might have used 30 years ago, or 40 years ago, or however many years ago. The idea here is that we are communicating not just with words and not just with referential semantics, but now with a very complex language of images and video and all of the rest with the semantics that are based, I don't want to say on shared meaning because that's not quite what I mean, but a semantics based on perspective, point of view, context, culture, and the rest of it. So this kind of communication becomes a skill. And, and this skill is going to involve a number of aspects. One major aspect is logic, thinking for yourself. Now, this isn't just the logic of Mr. Spock. This isn't just the logic of deductive inferences or even Sherlock Holmes. Uh, you eliminate all the other possibilities. Whatever remains must be the truth. This is a logic that goes beyond that. It is critical thinking. It is creative thinking. It is media awareness. It is an understanding of, I'm gesturing wildly here. Nobody can see this, but I'm gesturing wildly, just so you know. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's being able to understand, to comprehend the meaning of these various words, where a word might be any multimedia object, in the context in which it was uttered, in the context in which it was received. The idea here is being able to see one of these objects from many different points of view, from many different perspectives, and to, as a perceiver, be able to understand some sort of whole from those different perspectives to construct, I don't want to say construct because that's not exactly what I mean, but to create some sort of whole from those different perspectives. So logic, critical thinking, what some people call 21st century skills are a key part of this new kind of learning. And then finally, third, Learning itself, what we mean by learning itself. And I, I've alluded to this a few times already. Uh, I've alluded to the idea that learning isn't about the three R's. It isn't object-based learning. It isn't collecting a bunch of facts. It isn't collecting a bunch of skills. Uh, you know, you're, you're going to hear from time to time things like competencies and all of that. And it, it's not that even so much. Rather, learning is acquiring this capacity to deal with data, to deal with phenomena, to deal with situations in a dynamic, creative, uh, innovative way. Douglas Rushkoff talks about the new way of treating data. Uh, he talks about surfing rather than acquiring, the way a person will surf through websites, the way a person will surf the internet. The way we want to treat knowledge in, in this new era is the way the surfer treats a wave. And the surfer doesn't try to memorize the position of the wave. The surfer doesn't try to capture what the wave is like in his mind, doesn't try to remember specific techniques, but rather the surfer tries to balance skills against the dynamic changing nature of the wave, to see patterns in the wave, to react to those patterns in the wave. So the idea here is learning is a matter of tuning our senses, tuning our, our capacity to experience, tuning our capacity to perceive patterns, tuning our capacity to create, to innovate, to, to think uh, on our feet, if you will, to react to changing circumstances. And what if you can't surf? Well, then your name is Charlie. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't resist that. OK, so I've covered two aspects now. I've, I've covered what it is I think learning will be like. And I've covered what learning is, what it is that learners will actually do. And now I want to talk about the technological framework. And this is the part that everybody gets hung up about. You know, so we've talked two-thirds of this talk or more have gone by. I haven't talked about Twitter once. I haven't talked about blogs once. Because really what it's about is what we're up to and what learning is. And now we get to the tools. And just as I said in the preface to this talk, 
and looking at these tools from the perspective of what it is that we want to do and how it is that we're going to do it. You know, people say, oh, you know, technology is just a tool, and that's not quite true. But it's close enough to true for our, our certain for our uh, for our purposes here. But the trick when you say technology is not a tool, the trick is to get the thing that it is that you're trying to do right. And this is where you know people say technology is not a tool, and then they say, okay, so we'll go back to teaching in classrooms then, and technology is just a tool for that. Well, they got the part about technology is just a tool, right? But then they got the nature of the project completely wrong. So that's why I spent a lot of time on the nature of the project. So how? Well, let's return to the concept of learning objects. Learning objects were just getting big back when uh, I began to write in 1998. Uh, their history actually predates that by almost a decade. The original sense of learning objects is that they would be small, reusable bits of digital content that could be used for the purposes of learning. And the model that was used, there are various models, but the Wayne Hodgins, the original model, the idea was that learning objects were like Legos. And so each learning object would be like an individual Lego piece, and you would snap all, the, all of these learning objects together in order to form one large piece of learning. And if you can see my hands moving here, my hands are like forming this ball in front of me, this big Lego ball in front of me. We really missed the video, I'll tell you. Well, that picture of uh, learning objects didn't really work, and there's many reasons why it didn't work. And mostly why it didn't work is because that's not how people create learning. Even teachers don't create this big object that is a course. Now, distance education designers, people who are creating course packages for the military, say, or, you know, uh, learning manuals for large corporations. That's kind of what they do. They create these great big honking courses, right? But most people don't learn that way. Most people don't create learning that way. Rather, uh, you know, you're all teachers in the classroom, and you, you grab from here, and you grab from there, and you grab from there, and you grab from there, and yes, you have a plan at the start. But you know, each class is a new experience. It's all dynamic. It's all changing. You wouldn't create the entirety of your class for three weeks from now because you don't know what's going to happen two weeks from now. And the same thing with learning objects. We don't want learning objects that are such that we're going to join a whole bunch of them together and create this great big learning uh, course or whatever. Rather, what we want is a system of distributed resources, resources that are at our fingertips that we can just pull out from the ether as we need it. Uh, we want learning resources to be the words, the digital multimedia words that we have at our disposal when we want to explain just such a concept to some other person. So picture in your mind. You're reaching into the ether, grabbing this word, you grab this word, you do whatever with this word, and then this word expresses just the concept that you wanted to teach or you wanted to explain at this point in time. So learning objects, yes, but not learning objects to create courses, rather learning objects as a set of distributed resources that we simply access whenever we need to access them. OK, how does that work? Well, there's a network out there. There's you and there's your network of friends. So you have all of the people that you know, and then there are all the different resources that you use to talk to each other. Um, the, you know, the Flickr picture is one word. The YouTube video that you created is another word. The Twitter is a very short, small word. Twitter is the if of, or the it of uh, digital objects, if you will. Uh, instant messages, all these different kinds of content. And so already now you can see, and you see this diagram in front of you, right? There's this, this web of interactions created between you and your friends using all of these words. Now, the way this web works is a community process, you and your friends, your friends and their friends, their friends and their friends. So it's not just a small closed community, but it's rather a community of communities. And each individual, each node, each person in this network goes through 
four identifiable states. Uh, this again is just the taxonomy. It's just a way of labeling these steps so that we can get a handle on them. Uh, you know, it's not a defining thing. It's a descriptive thing. So aggregation, remixing, repurposing, feed forward. Aggregation is the mechanism by which we reach out into the ether and pull resources to ourselves. We do that in many ways even now. We do it with, uh, by reading our SS feeds. We do it by subscribing to Twitter. We do it by going to YouTube and browsing whatever. You bring these things together, and then you remix them. You take something from Chris, something from Chiga, something from Gumbo, and you mix them all together. Now you're creating something new. So you're remixing these things. And then you start to work them. You start to shape them. You start to add things to them. You add your own content to them, your own experience, your own perspective. You are now repurposing these resources. Kind of like you get a picture from Fred, you put your own caption on it. So you got the picture, you've aggregated, and you, you put a caption on it, you've repurposed it. And then the next thing, the final thing you want to do is share. You want to share this with your friends that you got this stuff from the first place. So you send it out. You send it out in your blog. You send it out in your Flickr account. You send it out in Facebook. You send it out wherever. And so now you get this network of interactions, each of us as a node, Bringing these little bits of digital content back and forth to each other. And it's in this interaction between each other that we share our experiences, we share our concepts, we share our ideas, and that interaction is what creates the network of ambient learning that is available for anybody who needs it to simply pull it from the ether. The RSS is the key, don't you think? Yes. RSS or something like RSS is very important. And you know, this is the point in the presentation where I can talk for several hours about detailed content syndication, specifications, representational state transfers, application programming interfaces, web services, simple object access protocol, and all the rest of it. There's a pile of stuff here that goes into making this network work. The important thing is is first of all, this stuff exists. All of these things already exist. And secondly, this network is already now taking form. This network exists now. All of you here in the seminar are participating in this network. As you sit here, you are participating in this. So what happens then? How is the teaching happening? How is the learning happening? Well, those who do, Create. Now, what, what I mean by that is that the, the, the practice of a profession and the teaching of a profession basically become one and the same thing. A physicist does physics, but in the doing of physics, in an open and sharing way, is also a teacher of physics. A person who works in the forest, a silviculturalist, does silviculture. But by doing silviculture, by doing so in an open way, that person becomes a teacher of silviculture. Because what happens is when we work and live in, a, in an era of ambient learning, of ambient connection, all of our actions, all of our participation in the community creates artifacts. It creates traces. It creates a record of our activities. It creates a record of successes. And it creates a record of failures. It gives us the picture, the model, the demonstration that we want to use in order to inform people who follow us what the successful practice in that profession looks like. This is much better than the old way. The old way, we used to have to somehow try to record that information. We'd get a subject matter expert, and we'd, we'd interview them, and we'd ask them what is expertise in physics, what is expertise in silviculture, and then we'd take this and we'd transcribe it and, and write big clumsy documents called textbooks. And then people would try to learn from those textbooks, and then they would write tests based on those textbooks, and that was how they learned how to be a silviculturalist. Now, they go into the forest, they have their portable digital devices. They have their ambient learning. They learn about forestry in a forest from the actual practice of foresters who have gone before them. That is learning in the network age. 
What we do basically is we create worlds within worlds within worlds. Our experience one day becomes the basis for a learning experience the next day, becomes the basis for a real experience the day after that. To perform a task is to model that task, is to demonstrate that task. Modeling and demonstrating are the essence of teaching. And modeling and demonstrating in an open, interconnected internet are the essence of teaching, the essence of teaching in an open internet. A person who's learning in this internet is practicing and reflecting based on those models and, and based on those demonstrations. And then the mechanics of that, the actual software that we use for that, this is software we're already beginning to see be developed. Simulations. Simulations like flight simulators, which is how that guy was able to land in the Hudson River, by the way, because that's not the sort of thing you practice. So you have to use a simulator. Uh, simulations like second life. Immersions. Immersions, not just immersions in the sense of sensory immersion, but also immersion in the sense of community immersion. Instead of learning about silviculture separate from all the foresters in the world, you learn about silviculture by interacting, by being immersed in the actual community of silviculturalists. Gina Minx writes, who will write the simulations? Well, think about this. The simulations, to a large degree, will write themselves. The idea here is that software that is able to capture the, the essentials, the, the mechanics of successful practice, will be, able to, will be able to emulate those mechanics in generic simulation environments. That's a, a digression, but a useful one. Uh, communities, the, the immersion in games, immersions in other sorts of practice and practice areas. Anyhow, my nose is dripping, I'm sorry. That basically is the picture of living in the future. Again, a lot of this isn't in your classroom. Uh, a lot of this won't be in your classroom for a long time. But again, now to go back to the beginning of this presentation, anytime you see a piece of technology, you can ask yourself, you know, is it supporting ambient learning? Is it supporting openness? Is it, is it supporting a diversity of experience? Is it supporting sharing? Is it supporting autonomy, the, the actions that people undertake in order to practice for themselves? If it's doing that, then it's probably technology that will help you in your task. But you know, if, if it's simply another way to tell, uh, if it's simply another way that creates some sort of intermediary or some sort of barrier between the experience and the practice, then it's probably not the sort of technology, not the sort of pedagogy that you want to be favoring in your own work going forward. So, <laughs> like every, like me, uh, you may want to listen to this audio again later on just to see what was said. But uh, I thank you for your time, and I know it was a bit of a deluge, but uh, uh, you can always find more on my website, and there it is. So that's the end of the spoken portion of this, and uh, if you have questions or comments, I'd love to hear from you. And uh, Alex, it's back over to you. Oh, turn off mic, right. Can you hear me okay? I think so. All right. I want to thank uh, Stephen very much for this presentation. Obviously, there's a lot there, um, and and if anyone's going to uh, explain what's sort of uh, going to be happening in the ten years, it's Stephen uh, that will uh, be able to do that for us. And uh, I guess I want to start with a with a couple of questions, but I'd really like to encourage other people to ask because there's been a number of great questions throughout the chat tonight. Um, I'm wondering what your what your thoughts are about the assessment piece and how the assessment moves to uh, in like maybe an open accreditation model, um, and you don't have to ask those questions, answer those questions directly. What I'm thinking more so is, um, you know, we have this model emerging, but with the institutions as they are, with the assessments, with with accreditation as it is, how do we move? Um, I think you've mentioned once a while back that. Um, you know, we can sort of do what we do in the institutions, but uh, perhaps some institution, or maybe not even an institution, some sort of model uh, rises uh, beside the existing one to eventually usurp it or, or replace it. So I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on how we actually get to this place, because there are a number of obstacles in between 
this sort of ideal versus what we currently do uh, in schools with teacher education, et cetera, et cetera. So I'd love to hear what your thoughts about maybe getting to that point would be. So uh, feel free to attack that from any spot uh, you want, Stephen. And perhaps uh, after Stephen has spoken, I'd love to see you raise your hands uh, in the chat room to ask any questions you like as well. Yeah, everyone loves the question of assessment. Uh, and there's about eight different answers to it. Uh, all of which lead to more or less the same point. You know, when George Stevens and I did the uh, connectivism course in the fall, there was the formal assessment component of the course. The 24-page students had to submit assignments, and George marked them, and they got grades. But uh, we had another student from Israel who wrote in with a proposal, which we accepted, that they would take the course from us, but they would be assessed by their home institutions. And all of a sudden, we had a model. Right? We had a model where we have this single massive distributed online course, which is really nothing more than controlled chaos. And out of the activities in that course, people could apply to and be assessed by various institutions. So out of the one connectivism course, you know, some people being assessed by the University of Manitoba, another person being assessed by some university in Israel, say some people being assessed by their grade 12 teachers, some people being assessed by, um, you know, you can make up your own list of uh, assessment agencies. And that's kind of what's going to happen. That's kind of what's already happening where the, the practice of assessment is in an important way being cleaved or separated from the practice of of teaching and learning, you know, and this, of course, in a roundabout way and in a very clumsy hand-handed way, is what that whole standardized testing, standards-based learning was supposed to be all about. The whole idea here was to create some sort of independent mechanism for assessment that was separate from the actual process of teaching. Uh, now, that was very badly done. And standardized tests isn't the way to separate uh, to separate to, you know, assessment from learning. But having multiple assessors testing according to multiple various criteria uh, against the same or similar body of actions or activities is the way forward. When you think about the environment that we're in now, we've already got many of the components of that already in place. We have things like the CGA test that evaluate accountants. We have things like uh, uh, the bar exams that evaluate lawyers. We have things like uh, uh, certified Nobel engineer and Microsoft A plus certification and the various other kinds of, uh, of assessment. But now, all of that, are, all of these things are still kind of clumsy, hand handed ways of getting at what it is that students actually know. Because what they really want to know in assessment is whether students are able to perform at such and such a level, whether they have the capacity to do brain surgery, whether they have the capacity to successfully land aircraft on the Hudson River without drowning everybody on the plane, whether they have the capacity to grow and harvest a pine tree, whether they have the capacity to write a letter to a client. And we have used testing as an intermediary because we have no way of getting at the actual practice. But as students grow up and perform in an open way, in an online way, more and more we are able to access directly data related to their performance. You want to know how good a pilot is? Just look at the syndicated feed of their singular performance for the last two months. You want to know how good a forester somebody is? Look at the growth records and all of their trees. And so now, of course, nobody's actually going to look at simulator records. Nobody's actually going to look at growth records of trees. But these testing agencies are going to. And these testing agencies are going to look at this actual performance data and produce performance summaries of individuals. And that's what our assessments of the future will look like. There will be performance summaries of actual practice and learning environments rather than test results. Hi, Stephen. Um, how are you? I am cold. 
<laughs> yeah, me too. Uh, this must be an East Coast thing. Um, I wrote a blog post um, that got a few people riled up in the last couple of days. Uh, and and the, the crux of the thing that's got them riled up is a distinction that I tried to make about how, uh, and this is in the context of Oakland Educational Resources, my, one of my concerns about them generally is that we're talking about, let's take your, your fishing rod analogy. Um, I understand how we can track someone's learning and get a sense of how well they're doing based on planes not falling out of the sky, based on those kinds of things, uh, trees growing, you know. Um, the fishing rod analogy is troubling for me. How can a semantical system decide what is the right way to cast a fishing rod when I have never met two fishermen who would agree on that particular subject? And how are you going to, to me, it almost necessitates a semantic overlay and thereby a bunch of decisions that end up getting made by metadata people, the same way that happened with LORs and the way that Dublin meta metadata was, was imposed upon stuff to structure the way that knowledge could be accessed, retrieved, and then redistributed. One of the beauties of the way that the sort of community structure works is that everybody comes away with their own version of that knowledge. What I don't understand is how you flip that around and say, OK, so, so you can go from the general to the specific for the individual's case when they're actually pulling that out. But how can you go out from the fishing rod to the right way of casting the fishing rod for that person? So that's where I kind of get confused, and I never know how we can make this system work out and looking into the future without seeing a bunch of, I hate to say it, but a bunch of, say, librarian type folks coming in and structuring the whole thing. Um, from the top down so that we can pull that information out of the system. Okay. The structuring thing is a non-starter. <laughs> you know that. I know that. And let's broadcast that to the world. We are not going to be able to ever produce the volume or quantity of structured data that will be needed to make those sorts of decisions. This is why the artificial intelligence program based on expert systems failed in the 60s and the 70s, and this is why the semantic web fails in the 2000s. You heard it from me, well, probably not first and probably not last. The idea here is there isn't one best way, and this is generally true. This is genetically true. It's, it's kind of ironic that our educational system has focused on the exception rather than the rule. Our education system has focused on types of knowledge where there is a best way. Right? There is one best answer to what is the capital of North Dakota. Uh, it's what, Bismarck or whatever. Right? And, but that's the exception, not the rule. That's the very, very rare exception. Generally, out there in the world, there is not a best way, there is a best fit. And that's a key distinction, and I've never heard of it quite like that, but it works quite well. Let me express that as follows. Think of the best fit as being the output of the network. Think of the network as having as input parameters all of the tasks that have ever been done, some indication of the success of those casts, for example, casts that have resulted in fish, casts that have not resulted in fish, casts that have gone 10 feet, casts that have gone 100 feet, all that data. Plus, data about the person who's currently holding the, fa the, the fishing rod, that the person is left-handed, that they're 6 foot 3 uh, inches tall, or however many centimeters that is, uh, that they're on the shore of a lake and not a river, that there's a wind blowing at 43 miles an hour from the north northwest, right? And all of these things, what they do when input to a network is they create a pattern in the network. The network, if you will, accepts that input and snaps to a certain shape. And snaps is exactly the right word. When you look at an image, you recognize that image. Your neural net, your brain, snaps to recognition. And so and you can actually feel that process happening. If you get one of those images like the, the duck rabbit or other gestalt images, uh, the, the young woman, the old lady, 
where there's two possible interpretations. Or more recently, that famous twirling ballot ballerina that first goes one way, then goes the other way. Your mind snaps or, or flips from one interpretation to the other. You actually feel it snapping into, into place. The network of connections of all of these resources snaps into place. And out of that, one resource is the best fit, and that is the resource that is delivered to you. And you might say, well, how do you know that resource is the best resource? Well, the answer to that question is, that is the resource that the network produces when it snaps to the best fit. There isn't some arbitrary, objectively neutral stance, this expert perspective that can say, yes, this is the one that it should have chosen. It's the performance of the network itself that makes that resource the best resource. And we will learn about this empirically. If it wasn't the best resource, suppose it was a crappy resource, sorry about the language, that information also gets fed back into the net. The structure of the net changes slightly, and that wouldn't be presented the next time similar circumstances were uh, presented. Yes, I'm talking about intelligent systems, but I'm not talking about expert systems. And the model we've been given with precise statements, precise answers, structured data, all of that, that is the model of expert systems. It is categorically a failure. And the model that I'm talking about is sometimes called a neural network system, sometimes called a connectionist system. And for large, complex tasks based on recognition, that kind of system is demonstrably successful. And demonstrably, it's a matter of mathematics, not opinion. I'm going to ask a follow-up question because nobody stopped me. Um, Stephen, the only worry, the other worry I have about this is, OK, network works that way. What about the weighting by volume and the weighting by sort of by popularity as it's sort of how the, and how that affects culture? So MIT puts out courseware. It's highly seen. It gets used more often. It gets repeated more often. That becomes stronger in the cultural wave and becomes a bigger part of the network, not because it's necessarily better, but because it's bigger, better recognized, has stronger sort of feet in the ground. And then we end up with moving even more towards popularization of what we end up seeing as knowledge and away from um, sort of the individuality of it that we're getting now on the, uh, on the interwebs. Yeah, there's two aspects to that, and I'll be fairly brief because I do know other people would like to ask questions as well. The first aspect is the distortion of the network uh, that is brought to bear by these large agencies. Uh, the network, the internet as we know it, isn't starting you know, from a zero state. It's starting for in an environment and in, an, in a culture where there are some big institutions, where there are some powerful and very well healed voices, where people can buy influence rather than earn influence, where MIT can do the same thing with some smaller agency and get all the credit for it because MIT has the better PR department, where people become A-list bloggers not because of the success of their blog, but because they were given a push from their newspaper, from their television show, whatever. There are distortions in the network. And that explains a lot of this imbalance in the network. Secondly, and this is, uh, you know, this is fostered by elements of the traditional media who are always looking for quote unquote winners, who are always looking for single individuals that they can key on as you know, the definitive statement of such and such, the one right answer as it were. Uh, these are based on misunderstandings of how networks and specifically recommender systems within networks work. Uh, they try to pick the one best resource that applies to everyone. But a proper recommender system doesn't work that way. A recommender system works on the principle, people like you who selected resources like this related or rated them like that. So the whole cultural thing, the whole background thing, that becomes part of the input parameters. Uh, you know, the, the recommender system takes the properties of me 
as being just as important as the properties of the resource that we are trying to select and the properties of the people who have rated similar sorts of resources in the past. And so what you get is not this rush to one or two or whatever resources that are, you know, number one with a bullet, but rather a much more evenly distributed, the right resource for the right person at the right time. Okay. Hello? Can you hear? Go ahead. Oh, hi, Stephen. This is a great conversation. My name is Angela. And I work with teachers at all levels. And I was saying in the chat room, they're so far away from what you're talking about. Really hardworking and willing teachers. And um, I'm, I'm looking at what do you think in practicality would be your advice for their first steps in looking at learning in this context when um, so much is on their plate about content coverage and, and testing and um, meeting AYP. What are your suggestions for basic first steps to even move them into this conversation? Well, that, that's a great question, Angela. Yeah, I'm going to ask you to turn off your microphone, please. Oops. Excellent. And I'm actually just trying to look up a presentation that I've made. Um, I, I was faced with this question once. I was giving a talk in Northern Ontario, uh, in North Bay, in fact. I, I give a talk in a uh, 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 an airplane hangar of all places, and same thing, right? The sort of stuff that I talk about is, uh, you know, way out there. It's not really something that that people experience in their own lives. But what I did is. I ask people to think of how they, as teachers, or how they, as college instructors in this case, would uh, conduct their own personal professional development. For, forget about, uh, you know, forget about what they're going to try to do for their students. Forget about what they're going to to do in their classroom. Think about what they're going to do for their own learning, and. Uh, you know, I don't have time to go through the whole details of that presentation. I've posted a link, which I hope is to the right thing. Uh, I'm going to be able to follow it through to the end here. No, it doesn't look like it. But no, you can also find it on my home page. Let's see. It's, it's sitting at the bottom of my home page. There's a video recording there. And uh, I'll, 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 I'll give you the, uh, the Google video link. If it's still working, Google Video has, uh, I think, been going down for the count recently. Uh, yeah. Hi, I'm Steve Downs. Thanks for inviting me to That's my video recording. Actually, starting out. Development. What I mean by that is not online courses or formal instruction over the internet, but rather <laughs> Sorry about that. Sorry about that. And there's still a way to go. There's still a way to go. Stephen, can you try turning your mic on and then off again? There we go. Sorry, Angela. I think I actually closed your microphone on you. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's okay. Yeah, this is the sort of thing that happens. Anyhow, that thing at the bottom of my uh, of my homepage, uh, and it's titled Web 2.0 in Your Own Learning and Development. If you look that up, what that does is describe those practical steps that you can take. If you take those practical steps, 
and if you, you follow that presentation through to the end, then you are conducting your own professional development in the manner consistent with the principles and the trends that I've talked about in this presentation. And so there is a relationship between what you can do practically on a day-to-day -day basis and these long-term trends that I've been talking about. And I'll move to the next question or the next comment. So Stephen, I've got a question for you. And, uh, and it's kind of an interesting question for me because I'm a motivated teacher leader. But I was wondering whether or not um, changing education or moving in the direction that you speak of is a fight that we should expect teachers to lead. I mean, do teachers even have the organizational power or influence necessary to make this kind of instruction a reality? And if not, who do we need to get on board? Who do we need on our side to push in the right direction? The representation of this as though it were a political movement or some such thing is probably not the best way to represent it. One of the things I learned, my, my training is in philosophy. And normally that's pretty useless for anything. But it taught me a really valuable lesson. And the lesson is you can't convince anyone of anything. And believe me, if, a philo if anybody can convince people, a philosopher can. I spent a lot of time learning how to argue really convincingly. And I would. I would argue really convincingly. And people would say, yeah, but I still believe what I believe. Right? So I think the only person you or any teacher can convince or bring on board with respect to any of this stuff is yourself. It's not a movement with leaders and followers. It's a case of each person making the decision for themselves which way to go. And when each person makes that decision for themselves, this, I believe, is what will result. But it's a gradual process. It's a process where, you know, one by one, people become empowered to make their own decisions in this regard. And, and as they do, we create the sort of network that I'm talking about. Does that make sense? I hope that makes sense. And then plugs in, you've nailed it. Convince implies a higher position, like philanthropy. Exactly the same distinction. My turn, Alec. Um, can you hear me? Uh, my question. My, my question is uh, it regards the students. I guess it seems to me that if high schools aren't giving students what they want, with the options that are becoming available to them, is it possible that we're going to see the death of the traditional high school uh, as more and more students explore other avenues and the numbers uh, deciding on public high school? go the other way and start looking at, at online options? Well, the institutions have great lives uh, and great longevity. Excuse me. And they will long outlive their usefulness. So I'm not really inclined to talk about the death of a high school. I am willing to talk about the transmography transmogrification, to borrow a term from Calvin and Hobbes, of the high school. I mean, the high school is going to change you know, from a Volkswagen to a jet airplane while it's moving. And that's going to be what it feels like inside the high school. But that said, you're absolutely right. People will be voting with their feet. People will be voting with their attention. And they're already doing this. And it hasn't worked well so far. I mean, uh, Al Gore writes in The Assault on Reason that people voted in the last three or four decades against reason, against rationality, by voting with their attention to watch Gilligan's Island instead of to learn to read, to argue, and to reason. And he's exactly right on that point. 
uh, you know, high school, any school represents a small percentage of a person's learning activities. A human brain, the way a human brain is constructed, it is learning all the time. Uh, you know, it doesn't stop learning. The only question is not whether it learns, but what it learns. And so, all these activities that take place outside school all constitute a part of this learning environment. And the real big change in learning that is taking place, and this is a very hopeful one, is instead of watching Gilligan Island, people are, are creating, they're communicating, they're building, they're arguing, they're reading, they're writing, and the, the whole range of interactive web phenomena. This is a huge change in our society. Uh, you have to see Barack Obama on the TV across the room, and I think that's one of the results. You know, uh, it's now possible to contemplate presidents who are thoughtful and who are literate, um, which you know, in, in the age of television, was harder to contemplate. Uh, people are following their own path in learning, and I think what happens in the school is that it infiltrates you. Uh, you know, infiltrates in with great wailing and gnashing of teeth on the part of people who are already inside as they do everything they can to stop it from coming in. But, you know, more and more, uh, schoolwork becomes practical experience. More and more, sitting there learning from a book becomes learning from a community online. And it's a gradual process and it's an uneven process. And I think. You know, we won't recognize the high school of the future uh, compared to the high school of today, but we also won't be really be able to identify the point at which the change happened. Anyone else want to ask a question? I know there's been a, a few in the chat room. All right. If that's uh, the last question, unless someone stops me, I just really want to thank uh, Stephen for uh, giving us a terrific uh, presentation and for following up with some great conversation. Um, can can we give Stephen the uh, applause? If you can hit the applause button, it would be great if we can uh, thank him so much for being here today. Oh, Miles, you have a question? Or did you hit the wrong button? Do you have a question, Miles? I'll just give a second to Miles here. Miles, is that a question button? I will turn off the mic. Well, thanks, everyone, and uh, I really appreciate the time that you've taken in your evening. And it looks like Barack Obama is just about to uh, talk, so you can get away from here and get over to your TV <laughs> if that's what you want to do. Thanks a lot for your time. I really do appreciate it. Thanks again so much, Stephen. Uh, we, we really appreciate you having you here. And, of course, we've got Stephen and then Barack. So uh, a double-header evening. Uh, just one announcement to uh, the students of this class. Next week, we are actually going to have the students of ECNI 831 from last year joining us. So that will be sort of our conversation for next day. So they'll talk about uh, where they've gone for the next, uh, you know, for the year after and uh, how their learning has continued in a lot of cases. So I'm looking really forward to that conversation. Um, so that will be very nice and as Cindy is in the room right now uh, at Roadrunner there and she'll be part of that so we're very thankful Cindy for actually coming up with the idea I think it's a great idea that we can connect this class this section to the group from before and see how we can go somewhere together and at least compare of where we might be um, so again thanks Stephen and good night everyone and take care all